Section 15 of The Destination of Man by Johann Gottlieb Fichte Translated by Jane Sinnott This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 15. Faith. A member of two orders. This, then, is my true nature, my whole sublime destination. I am a member of two orders, of one purely spiritual, in which I rule merely by pure will, and of a sensuous one, in which my act alone avails. The whole aim of reason is its own activity, independent, unconditional, and having no need of any organ beyond itself. The will is the living principle of the rational soul, is indeed itself reason when purely and simply apprehended. That reason is itself active means that the pure will as such rules and is effectual. The infinite reason alone lies immediately and entirely in the purely spiritual order. The finite being lives necessarily at the same time in a sensuous order, that is to say, in one which presents to him other objects than those of pure reason, a material object to be advanced by instruments and powers, standing indeed under the immediate command of the will but whose efficacy is conditional also on its own natural laws. Yet, as certainly as reason is reason, must the will operate absolutely by itself and independently of all the natural laws which determine the action. And therefore does the sensuous life of every finite being point towards a higher, into which the will itself shall lead him, and of which it shall procure him possession a possession which indeed will be again sensually present as a state and by no means as a mere will these two orders the purely spiritual and the sensuous the latter consisting of an immeasurable succession of states have existed in me from the first moment of the development of my active reason and proceed parallel to each other the latter, producing phenomena cognizable by myself and by other beings similar to myself, the former alone bestowing on them significance, purpose, and value. I am immortal, imperishable, eternal, as soon as I form the resolution to obey the laws of eternal reason. I am not merely destined to become so. The transcendental world is no future world. It is now present it can at no period of finite existence be more present than at another not more after the lapse of myriads of ages than at this moment my future sensuous existence may be liable to various modifications but these are just as little true life as those of the present by that resolution of the will i lay hold on eternity and rise high above all transitory states of existence my will itself becomes for me a spring of eternal life when it becomes a source of moral goodness without view to any future object without inquiry as to whether my will may or may not have any result it shall be brought into harmony with the moral law my will shall stand alone apart from all that is not itself and be a world to itself not merely as not proceeding from anything gone before but as not giving birth to anything following by which its efficacy might be brought under the operation of a foreign law did any second effect proceed from it and from this again a third in any conceivable sensuous world opposed to that of spirit its strength would be broken by the resistance it would encounter the mode of its operation would no longer exactly correspond to the idea of volition and the will would not remain free but be limited by the peculiar laws of its heterogeneous sphere of action thus indeed i must regard the will in the present material world the only one known to me 
I am indeed compelled to believe, or to act as if I believed, that by my mere volition, my tongue, my hand, my foot, could be set in motion. But how an impulse of intelligence, a mere thought, can be the principle of motion to a heavy material mass, is not only not conceivable, but to the mere understanding an absurdity. To the understanding, the movements of matter can only be explained by the supposition of forces existing in matter itself. Such a view of the will as I have taken can only be attained by the conviction that it is not merely the highest active principle for this world, as it might be without freedom, and as we imagine a productive force in nature to be, but that it looks beyond all earthly objects and includes its own ultimate object in itself. By this view of my will, I am referred to a supersensuous order of things in which the will, without the assistance of any organ out of itself, becomes in a purely spiritual sphere, accessible to it and similar to itself, an effective cause. The knowledge that a virtuous will is to be cherished for its own sake is a fact intuitively perceived, not attainable by any other method. That the promotion of this virtuous will is according to reason, and the source of all that is truly reasonable, that it is not to be adjusted by anything else, but that all else is to be adjusted by it, is a conviction which I have likewise attained by this inward method from these two terms i arrive at a faith in an eternal supersensuous world should i renounce the first i abandon at the same time the latter if as many say assuming it without further proof as self-evident as the highest point of human wisdom that all human virtue must have a certain definite eternal aim and that we must be sure of the attainment of this end before we can act virtuously and that consequently reason by no means contains within itself the principle and the standard of its own activity but must discover this standard by the contemplation of the external world then might the entire purpose of our existence be found below our earthly destiny would be entirely explanatory and exhaustive of our human nature and we should have no rational ground for raising our thoughts above the present life as i have now spoken however can every thinker who has anywhere historically received those propositions also speak and teach and accurately reason but he would present to us the thoughts of others and not his own and all would float before him empty and without significance because he would be wanting in the sense by which he might seize on its reality. He is like a blind man who may have learned historically certain truths concerning colors, and built upon them just theories, without any color in fact existing for him. He may say that under certain conditions so and so must be, but not that it is so for him, because he does not stand under these conditions. The sense by which we may lay hold on eternal life can only be attained by a real renunciation of the sensual and all its objects, for the sake of that law which lays claim only to our will and not to our act. It surrenders these things with the fullest conviction that this conduct only is truly rational. By this renunciation of the earthly, does the faith in the eternal rise in our soul and stand there alone as the sole support to which we can cling as the only animating principle that can warm our hearts or inspire our lives we must truly according to the image of a holy doctrine first die to the world and be born again before we can enter the kingdom of god I see now clearly the cause of my former indifference and blindness to spiritual things. Occupied only with earthly objects, all my thoughts and endeavors fixed upon them, moved only by desire of a result, of consequences to be realized out of myself, 
unsusceptible and dead to the pure impulse of legislative reason which presents to us an end purely spiritual the immortal psyche remains with her pinions bound and fastened to the earth our philosophy is the history of our own heart and life and according to what we find in ourselves is our view of man and his destiny no true freedom exists for us so long as we are urged only by the desire of what can be realized in this world our freedom is no more than that of the plant more wonderful in its result but not in its nature higher instead of a certain conformation of matter with roots leaves and blossoms bringing forth a mind with thoughts and actions we cannot understand true freedom as long as we are not in possession of it we either draw down the word to our own signification or simply declare all such phrase to be nonsense by wanting the knowledge of our own freedom we lose at the same time all sense of another world all discussions of this kind pass by us like words with which we have no concern like pale shadows without form or color or meaning on which we know not how to lay hold should we be urged by a more active zeal to investigate them we should separate see clearly and be able to prove that all these ideas are mere worthless and untenable reveries which a sound understanding will reject at once and according to the premises from which we should proceed drawn from our own experience we should be perfectly in the right the doctrines preached in the midst of us even to the populace and from special authority concerning moral freedom duty and everlasting life are turned into romantic fables and have no more reality for us than those of tartarus and the elysian fields although from an opinion of their utility in restraining the people we do not say this openly in one word it is only by the thorough amelioration of the will that a new light is thrown on our existence and future destiny without this let me meditate as much as i will and be endowed with ever such rare intellectual gifts darkness remains in me and around me the improvement of the heart alone tends to true wisdom let then my whole life tend to this end end of section fifteen